I'm building cabinets for the aft cabin of my Albin 27. Hi, I'm Joe, and welcome to Motor City Boat Works. Let's get to work. This episode is part two of how I built some cabinets for the remodel for the aft cabin of my Albin 27 family cruiser. This is a lengthy project restoring the aft cabin and getting it set up for what will be some long-term cruising. If you're new to the channel and you're trying to figure out what we've got going on, be sure to check out the previous episode where I talk about building what I call the aft cabin cowling. Also, be sure to check out my playlist where I talk about building with composite materials because we're going to be using some of these materials to build the items that I'm talking about and there are some techniques that I'll be referring to so you need to know what's going on. So let's just do a little recap so we can be sure that everyone is following along. The first thing I did was create some bulkheads to separate the cockpit lockers from the aft cabin. There has to be a bulkhead on each side of the aft cabin. The next thing I did was begin to put together a mock-up, a pattern of what the piece of furniture would look like that's going to go underneath the companionway area to the aft cabin. I call this piece of furniture the aft cabin cowling. The reason I call it a cowling is because it reminds me of an engine covering or, or some type of a cowling on an airplane used to con cover up mechanical compartments or an engine. It will be able to be removed in one piece so things can be accessed underneath the cockpit sole, but it'll also be able to be put back no problem. This piece of furniture and cabinetry is a little bit complicated because there's a lot of angles and a lot of dimensions and of course nothing is straight in a boat. Everything is kind of curved or at an angle or in some cases just plain crooked from the way that the boat was built. Nothing is symmetrical. Once I have a pattern made out of pink EPS foam, I then took that and transferred it to PVC foam board. Now I've talked about this product before. In this case, I'm using a brand called Celtec. Celtec is a type of rigid PVC panel and it's very lightweight, but also stiff. The nice thing about it is you can cut it using woodworking tools. And of course it's waterproof. Once I have the pieces cut out for the aft cabin cowling, I assemble everything together using drywall screws. This just gives me a mock-up so I can get an idea of what the piece of furniture is going to look like and how everything goes together. At this point, I decided I was going to build some cubby holes that would be used for storage. These will be put on the face of the aft cabin cowling. What I'm doing here is I'm working on the aft cowling today and I'm trying to figure out some uh, dimensions for some cutouts on the facing of the cowling. So now what we're doing here, this is the cubby hole here. You can see I'm, I'm, I'm doing some uh, measurements here to try and figure it out. My first measurement, I started with this smaller hole and then I kind of realized, well, it's not really big enough even to get my hand inside of, so I went one size bigger. This was six inches wide. This is now seven inches wide by almost uh, eight inches. And I think it's gonna be fantastic. Cubby holes are better than drawers. Why? Because drawers, over time, uh, if they're made of wood, they will expand and, uh, co and contract. They change with moisture and they can get difficult to pull in and out. They always break and uh, uh, they also require a lot of space. You, if you have a drawer, it has to be able to open a certain amount in order to be able to put things inside of it. But on a boat, cubby holes are excellent. Uh, when a drawer is closed also, there's no air circulation inside there. And if things are left alone or they get put away uh, slightly damp or anything like that, you, you run the risk of mold growing, especially in tropical climates. So when you have cubby holes, everything's open. Airflow is real free. And uh, it's always very easy to pull things in and out. It's a lazy man's way of storing stuff. And I just love cubby holes. Cubby holes and, and uh, stretch netting. It's awesome. This is a two inch uh, piece in there. So it's two cutouts, but it'll be one box behind it and with a shelf in between. And that's what separates the two. And we'll do one on each side. Now to make the radius here in the corner, to make this radius here in the corner, I always uh, use something that I have handy. It doesn't really matter what you use, as long as it's the same thing for every one of the radiuses that you do on a particular project. 
oftentimes I will use a roll of tape if I happen to have it handy, or even better, sometimes I'll use uh, the radius of a can of paint. That way I know it's the same thing every single time. And you just line it up and then draw your radius and cut it with a jigsaw. Are you enjoying the show? Well, do me a favor. Would you hit the like button and also subscribe? Spread the word about Motor City Boat Works. No BS, just boats and restoration. <laughs> what I'm gonna be doing is cutting four holes in the front of the cowling. I will be creating uh, like a box, like a drawer that goes on the back side. And these cutouts will be very similar to what we've got up here on the pilot house, these cubby holes that you can stuff stuff inside. And uh, um, it's very similar to what I used in the V-Birth for the forward shelves and uh, cockpit shelves. And we're doing the same thing in the aft cabin. I love cubby holes. With the cubby holes cut out and everything rounded over looking good, now it's time to start assembling the pieces. And I do this using what I call the screw and glue method. I've talked about this before. Basically, I'm using drywall screws to pre-assemble everything so that it's all aligned. And then I go back, I disassemble the item, and I put epoxy into the joints and screw everything back together. Once the epoxy has set up, it's time to remove the drywall screws and perhaps lay in some epoxy fillets. These will be extra amounts of epoxy in the corners to give it a little bit of extra strength. Now remember, it's important before you do any type of epoxying on PVC foam board, you gotta make sure that the PVC foam board has been roughed up a little bit. I like to use 150 to 200 grit sandpaper. Everything's gotta be sanded. The epoxy has to have a surface that it can grab onto. And PVC foam board, as it comes from the factory, well, it's just too slick. So you can see here, I've got everything assembled. We've got epoxy in the corners. And uh, it's real nice. Everything's nice and secure. Now we're gonna remove the screws from the cabinet here. And eventually, you can see here, we'll fill the holes with epoxy and then sand them down flush and use a roundover bit, roundover bit to take over this edge, take off this edge right here. And it uh, looks pretty primitive right now, but it will clean up quite nice later on. Especially all of this here. You can see we've reinforced the bottom with some epoxy. So that's in the corner here. Should work real well. We've successfully glued these boxes together and uh, begun to fill the screw holes with epoxy. Tiny, tiny fillets are laid in inside the box and everything is well put together. It's gonna to be perfectly strong. Now what we wanna do is we're gonna use a roundover bit to take down this edge on the outside all the way around here. And uh, that'll give it a nice kind of round shape, take off the sharp edges. And then uh, we'll sand this down and have it ready to go so that it can be affixed to the facing of the cowling, which the cowling is put together. We've got the wings put on, and uh, they're also, it's all glued now. There's no screws or anything. But in order to affix the boxes to the back of this here, these need to be routed beforehand because we can't route them after the fact. We won't be able to get the router into the corner when the facing's on there. So we'll do this first and then we'll attach them to the cowling. We'll epoxy those in place. And at that point, pretty much the rough up is done. And then we just begin doing the final finishing. A one quarter inch round over bit. And I set it so that it's flush at the bottom of the router. And that will give me a nice round over. But before, anytime you do this, before you start actually routing the your piece that you got finished, you gotta, you gotta make sure and do a test run on some scrap material here, which is what we're gonna do. Make sure that your depth is set properly. Sometimes it needs a little adjustment to get it to look right. Mm. 
Now, you should be able to see what I did here. You can see that round over, but it's not quite enough. I feel like it's not really the right profile that I like. So I will set this just a little bit lower. If you set, if you set your depth too deep, you'll get a little lip here. Now that can be nice if that's the effect that you're going for, but in most cases we want just a nice round over. Uh, so. And I don't know if you can tell, but now we got the right angle here. It's just an ever so slight adjustment and of course, when you sand this further, it'll get even more nice and rounded. Today is going to be a sanding day. I generally like to wait until I have a bunch of items that need to be sanded inside the shop, whether they're fiberglass or PVC composite or even teak wood or something like that. I like to make sure that uh, I kind of do all my sanding at one time because the cleanup, you know, takes so long that it's easier just to make one big mess. Uh, for one day and then come back and clean it up and, and instead of doing it every single day So today we're going to be doing uh, about three or four different sanding projects We've got uh, fiberglass on the deck that's got to be sanded I've got some paint that actually needs to be lightly sanded We're working on the aft cabin cowling. We're going to be sanding the PVC furniture that we built and uh, Trying to get a bunch of things done. So uh, That's the plan for today, right? Sanding you always got to have a mask and uh, I just wanted to cover a couple of things. So one of the things that I use inside the shop, the ceilings are so tall in here, they're somewhere around 16 feet tall. And uh, so I really have a lot of volume inside the shop here. And uh, when you start sanding, you know, the dust kind of goes everywhere, aerosol. So one of the things that I have is a uh, shop filter very similar to what you what they it's a wood you know they use them in wood shops or whatever and uh, this is the actual filter it's right now mounted on top of the wire station when I begin doing the wiring for the boat there'll be all rolls and spools of wire and plumbing hose and things that go on top of this this uh, what I call a wire station I bought this off a of Craigslist for 50 bucks from a company that was going out of business and uh, it's actually turned out to be quite brilliant because it's uh, it's heavy metal and uh, it's really quite solid and and uh, well balanced and I'm able to put the you know 100 pound uh, air filter up on top of it and then run an extension cord and I can move it around the shop to get it close to the area where I'm working now it doesn't suck you know dust like a vacuum cleaner does or like the built-in uh, dust filter system that I have for the shop tools but it does help to kind of pull in some of the suspended particles and I've gone ahead and added an extra filter to increase the surface area of the filter normally this is flat across here it's just one filter but by making it two if you can see it doubles the surface area that can catch particles and kind of pulls them all in there. And it does help keeping some of the dust down uh, and not make it so nasty. Either way, look, there's still going to be dust. There's always dust in the shop. Uh, people comment that the shop is so amazingly clean, but a lot of times it's just the illusion of the cameras and stuff. Uh, if you're doing boat work, real boat work, your shop's going to be dirty and and it's a full-time job just trying to keep the dust down and trying to keep services clean uh because the, it contaminates project after project after project you try and glue something it's contaminated you try and paint something well now it's got dust on it and so you really got to kind of work overtime on it and that's why i like to wait to try and get all of my sanding projects done at one time uh in ink you know in groups and increments so that the shop is only dirty for a period of time so let's turn this thing on here this is the jet air filter it's called an afs 1000 it has a remote control but i don't have that uh set up right now you turn it on you can hear it makes a little bit of noise 
and it's actually blowing pretty good air here we set it on high and it makes a little bit of noise but it's not too bad now in the meantime we turn off the heater system so that that doesn't accidentally kick on and suck all particles into the heater and we should be good to go i get asked a lot what type of sanding tools and things like that do you use and you know my go my go-to brand is actually black and decker I, I i i'm surprised that i'm saying that but the the problem with the hand tools when you're working on a boat especially fiberglass boat is uh they wear out and anybody who's been doing boat projects or boat building for a period of time they'll tell you that the tools just don't last. A lot of them are made in the same factories overseas. They're just rebranded. They may have different features and this and that, but the, the quality over the years has tended to go down as metal parts are replaced with plastic or composites and, and they just don't hold up over time. And let, let's be honest, when I'm working on the boat and I'm doing sanding, I mean, I abuse my tools. I don't take particularly very good care for them. Uh, I don't know that it would make a difference. Cutting thick fiberglass, uh sanding good quality fiberglass it really destroys the tools the dust gets in the gears it gets in the motors it affects the electrical components it just gets everywhere and, and you can clean them as much as you want with an air hose or a vacuum cleaner or whatever but they're they just they just wear out over time so i may be in the minority but my thought process on tools over the years has been not to choose the cheapest tools available because often they don't have the features that I really need and not to choose the most expensive tools that are available um, especially some of the name brand ones although I would love to have them but they're too expensive and of course I get no sponsors and have no compensation so you know I have to do things on a budget just like everybody else so I try to find a mid priced tool and I judge the value of the two tool based on how long it lasts be before complete failure. For sanding tools, for palm sanders, orbital sanders, things like that, uh, I've generally found that uh, none of them last. They all will eventually uh, kind of break and implode. Um, and uh, oftentimes they're lucky if you can get one year out of them, you know, hard, hard use. So I have several here on the shelf, you can see. So we've got a couple different ones here on, the, on here. We've got, we've got a Craftsman, we've got an Orbital Sander, we've got a, we got a uh, Belt Sander, we've got a variety of grinders and Dremels and things like that. And what I've found over the time is that they just, uh, they all break. Now, my preference for a sander uh, tends to be a smaller one quarter sheet palm sander and uh, with its own dedicated on off switch. It's gotta be in a particular position so your hand doesn't accidentally hit the on and off switch over and over. And uh, I prefer a palm sander without the Velcro on the bottom instead the metal clips on the side here you can see those metal clips there and the reason that is good for fiberglass sanding pvc composite sanding things like that is the dusk is so fine that it will ultimately clog the velcro uh the hook and loop connection on the bottom like for example this orbital sander this one does have a hook and loop on the bottom but i very rarely use it for anything other than maybe light polishing sanding or things like that the hook and loop just does not hold up over time when you're sanding repeatedly for hours and hours and hours on end the pad of the sander will get warm because there's a lot of friction and the hook and loop mechanism the nylon will melt over time if you're not careful yeah of course you're overusing i'm overusing the uh sander and i'm wearing it out and tearing it up no doubt about it but listen it's nasty work and it's got to get done so there's no mincing about we, we we get to it the fact that the hook and loop doesn't work well over a long period of time it means that you need a mechanical attachment for the sandpaper and that's going to be the metal clips that clip the quarter sheets in place one of the things i found is to buy boxes of sandpaper in full sheets eight by ten i've got some here 
your brand is kind of your choice or whatever, but buy them in full sheet boxes. They actually come in bigger boxes than this. And uh, then cut down, then, and then what you do is you cut down the sheets manually by hand into quarter sheets so that they fit in the palm sander. And it's quite a bit more economical than buying quarter sheets at a time. You'll go broke trying to buy quarter sheets to fill your sandpaper. The other thing that I like to do on my palm sanders is, uh, you'll notice on here is that I write on it a date, right? And uh, I started doing this a number of years ago as a way to kind of get an idea of like, well, how long are these tools lasting me? And what I found is that it really didn't matter what brand I was purchasing, the most expensive to the cheapest, because I have bought the expensive ones before. They only last so long, and you can buy the warranty replacement pans, but it's extremely difficult to get the manufacturers to honor those. There's a lot of loops and stuff you gotta jump through, and, and hoops you gotta jump through. It's a real pain, so it just became easier to buy a brand new sander and start from scratch, which is really what you want. A disposable tool, you throw it away and you start again. It's not economical, but it's not, it's not environmentally friendly, but that's what the manufacturers give you. They want to give you a, a, a pump sander with motors that's got plastic parts and things inside of it. Of course, it's going to break over hard use. So I put the dates on them now so I can keep track of, try and take advantage of any warranty that does happen, but also it's really been informative insofar as, well, how much should I be spending on a new pump sander? This last one I paid, uh, like the Black & Decker, I think it costs $30, $40 maybe $50, $30, $40, and it'll last you get a year, 18 months out of it, that's pretty good. And then you just go on from there. These are not your grandfather's tools that you're gonna hand down generation to generation, you know, made out of all metal and, and, and handcrafted whatever machine parts. I think we've reached a good stopping point. Oh, I know, it's awesome, isn't it? If you're new to the channel, maybe you don't know, but I try to keep the episodes around the 20 minute mark. I just can't spend any more time making videos. I've got to get back to work on the boat. Next episode, I promise, I'll be finishing the aft cabin cowling and the aft companionway step, and we'll begin discussing how I'm going to be finishing out the aft cabin of my pocket trawler. But if you're really interested and you want to see more of what's going on inside Motor City Boatworks, then be sure to subscribe and hit the notification button. It's the only way to get advance notice of the secret live streams that I sometimes offer from the boat shop. It's kind of like a behind the scenes look. The live streams have a chat option where you're able to ask me questions and I can talk about some of the things that are going on in the overall boat building process. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Stay motivated.